for those of you who are joining, my, my name is Cody DiArkland. I'm a technical marketing architect with VMware's Cloud Management Business Unit. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, advanced blueprinting and application delivery in cloud automation services. So from our previous demo, we have a couple of machines that have already been deployed, a couple of bits of infrastructure that are out in AWS already. But what if I'm a new project and I want to come on board and I want to start delivering applications quickly? I already have a platform in place and I already have some content in place, but I want to get started very quickly with the existing environment. I'm going to come into the infrastructure and I'm going to build a new project. Forgot to delete the TFD19 one in there, so we're just going to call this Tech Field Today. All is one word. From a provisioning standpoint, we're going to set this up to provision against a, specific, a couple of environments. We'll do, just for grins, we'll do GCP, and we will also do AWS. Now, a project is a, a, you can think of that as a logical segmentation engine inside of the platform. Blueprints are project specific. You can share blueprints across multiple projects, but they, there, is a, there is a barrier there that exists by default that says any, pro, any blueprints that are written are for this project specifically. So I'll go ahead and create that project. That project's in place now, so I have this tech field day project up here. Now, I don't want to have to write all of my blueprints, blueprints from scratch. Words are hard. So I'm going to come into integrations where I've already set up integrations in my environment, and I'm going to consume them in the platform. You can see that I have this friendly little GitHub icon over here, so one might assume that there is an integration there that allows me to bring blueprints in. I've already set this up in my environment, so I'm just going to consume that. I'm going to add my project to this integration. I'm going to choose the Tech Field Day project. And I'm going to add in some details. Don't worry what, what's coming on right here. I'm going to show this on a separate screen in a moment. I'm going to set blueprints. And I'm going to set next. Oh, did, what did I spell wrong? Again, words are hard, they don't own me, at least not anymore. So that maps back to this GitHub repo. This is publicly available, any of you can hit it. This is, this is github.com slash codeed slash CAS blueprints. These are the demo blueprints that I use in my everyday life. I have a couple of different applications in here that are all behind each one of these folders. I also have some of those actions for the extensibility that are, that are exposed here as well. And what I've done now is I've bound my, my CAS environment to this GitHub repo. So now whenever I push blueprints into this repo, they will automatically show up in that project. And I could bind that same repo across the entire environment in every project if I wanted to, and that gives you an ability to establish a baseline of blueprints, but it also gives you the ability to, to our conversation previously about being able to work on these blueprints from inside of something like VS Code being able to script inside of that platform and have all of the, the nice extens extension capabilities that exist within that platform, commit those into Git, and have them synchronize into the platform. By now, with my Rabble, that should have happened. Is there a question about to pop up I thought I heard? Yeah, just real quick. Shoot. Does that synchronization work in both directions? If you had a less advanced user who maybe you know wanted to make a modification of a blueprint that's, <coughs> that's stored in a GitHub repo, it, could they make a change visually, maybe a small configuration change, and have it commit backwards? Two second story on that one. No, it was an intentional choice at first. It's not going to stay that way. Uh, we wanted to try it coming inbound initially because that was the bigger ask that we had. Um, it was. We knew it was an experiment. We knew it was going to be a. How's it, how's this going to play? Because we were kind of split down the middle on what people wanted. Since it's been in, we've gotten the feedback consistently that, hey, we want two-way. Mm -hmm. Two-way will be put in. Okay. Uh, two-way exists for actions right now. So if I go into that other interface where I was doing extensibility mm -hmm. and I change that around and I commit it, that will push. And new ones that are created will automatically push. From a blueprint standpoint, it's one way right now. It's definitely not staying that way, and it was intentional. Okay. Thank you. So you see, all of these have come in. They're all mapped to tech field day. And you can see I have this fun little Tech Field Day 2019 app that's a little bit different than any of the apps we've seen so far. And it's really hard to read. But it has um, a series of package that installs. So it's going to install Nginx. And then it's going to run a series of commands against it. 
Something interesting to call out here is that we're using a platform for Cloud Init. I don't know if anybody in the room's heard of Cloud Init before. Cloud Init is a uh, industry standard cl cloud image customization tool. So instead of us building our own, our own agent and forcing you to install something that's proprietary VMware, we're using tools that the open source community has already designed and consuming them in the platform because again, some people are just doing things better. And cloud, cloud init is something that's widely used in AWS. It's used quite a bit in Azure. It's coming up a little bit more in, in GCP. It's not as much in GCP yet. You can think of cloud init as the vSphere customization spec supercharged. Has the ability to run packages, run commands. You can do file, file creations. You can do a number of different things in it. They have a website. It's just If you Google cloud init, you'll find a ton on it. What this is doing is doing a simple, a simple application install on Node.js. It's cloning a repo, it's building out that, that Angular app, and it's deploying into the environment. I've already tagged this with NVAWS. Even though this is a new project, I can still consume the same tags that I had already applied because I'm using existing zones. This is another huge change from the previous platform where a reservation was always very specific to, to the business group that was created. These zones now become a standard building block for you to use across provisioning in, in the entire platform. So I'm gonna do a deployment now. We're gonna let this ride against AWS. Fire that off. I actually think that this one was the same deployment, so we don't actually have to wait for it. So this was just a little web app that I wrote just for, for demoing this out. So this deployed using, using that same blueprint and, and fired off into the environment. So it's just simple. It does nothing other than tell you what it is, <laughs> as well as has some of the links to Tech Field Day, the Virize demo site, the, the VMware Cloud site, and then mine and John's Twitter handles because we're really self-centered in that way. So this deployed using that blueprint. And you can see that it was very, it's very clear now as this is stored in Git, I can come in and I can see exactly what's happening to this. And as I change this and add additional capabilities, maybe I bolt on a database and I add script for that and I version it. You're able to go in and see from a version control standpoint how this has changed over, over time. Likewise, if you're not using the integrated version control, you can use Git, which is in all likelihood if you're, if you're in the GitOps space, you're using GitHub. Git is gonna do version control better than we could ever dream <laughs> of doing version control. You could do it there as well. That being said, there are gaps in what CloudInit does. CloudInit is a, it's like a straight shot. We're running a series of commands. It doesn't know if it finishes, doesn't know if it's successful. It just knows, hey, I took some data in and I'm running it. To the point of other platforms doing things better, that's why we have integrations with Ansible and Puppet, because these are platform delivery tools, right? We're not going to reinvent the wheel and come up with our own config management platform. We have good partnerships with these groups. We're going to use them inside of, inside of the environment. So to that point, we have, again, Puppet as, as an object, and that's Puppet Enterprise. But as a interesting, an interesting turn, we use Ansible open source. So you can deploy out a, a Linux host, install Ansible open source on it, and bind to that. In previous VRA, that was Ansible Tower. Ansible Tower functionality is coming, um, but our focus out of the gate, we had a ton of feedback that, hey, I just love to use open source. I just need a playbook to run. I don't need <laughs> the wide management of, of Tower. I just need a playbook to run, and that's what we've done. So we enable you to bring uh, the Ansible object on and execute that playbook. When you mean that, when you say that um, uh, integration with Ansible Tower will, will come, does it mean that it will also work with AWX? The first pass is planned to be, to be Tower. I'm trying to lean on that a little bit, but on the books, it's tower. So. Because it's mostly compatible, right? One, one would think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. So, uh, but this one is, it is, it is Ansible, uh, Ansible open source. So if we go in and we do our little filter up here and we type in Ansible. So you have a couple of Ansible blueprints. Again, this goes out and simply deploys a playbook. So it looks on my Ansible host for a specific uh, host, the Ansible host file. It'll do a provisioning playbook. I can do deprovisioning playbooks, so I could have it back out. You know, for example, if I was doing my DNS there instead of using ABX, I could have a deprovisioning playbook go in and rip that stuff out as well. It's pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of not a lot of shine on it, but she's still she's still a pretty a pretty platform. It's just a, it's it's regular old Ansible playbooks. Uh, likewise, from Puppet, 
Uh, Puppet is much improved via, via previous integrations in the sense that now the agent installs via SSH, so it goes out, installs the agent the same way you would expect Puppet to install an agent. Uh, configures it, binds it to a Puppet Enterprise, and will pull down roles and execute those roles in the system. Something that I talk to customers a lot about when I talk about CAS is think of it less, it is a cloud management platform, it's what we, it's what we target at when we talk with Gartner and Forrester and all of these places, we, we talk about it as a, as a cloud management platform, but think about it more as an engine for executing automation against things. Think about it as the way that you can consume services in an automated fashion and how you can blueprint those out. And that's, when, we, when I talk about it from that perspective, the story of Ansible and Puppet and the future integrations that I can't talk about here uh, become, more, become more interesting because we're creating a platform for you to consume all of these different tools that you're likely going to be using regardless inside of your environment. I can't tell you how many groups use Puppet and Ansible inside, inside of enterprises. Nor, not, that I, not that I advocate for that, because I think that in that space in config management, you should leverage one and roll with that. But a lot of people have different teams that operate different ways. And we want to be very agnostic in that way. We want to offer you up a platform that lets you consume those services across whatever automation tool you want to use. Cody, as I've been just thinking, how am I going to start playing with this in my environment? Um, What's the communication between CAS and my on-prem uh, vSphere deployment? Great, great, great question. And we, we did breeze over that because that's normally normally boring bits, but that's that's totally. It's a, I it's, just want to know what I'm going to be doing next week. Uh, yeah, that's good. That's that's good, man. So we have this concept of a cloud proxy. So this is all hosted in SaaS right now, uh, but the cloud proxy is a VM, a relatively lightweight VM that deploys onto your on-premises infrastructure and effectively acts as a proxy between, between the services. And if I go into this one, you can see there's a number of services running. Cloud Assembly, the Blueprinting Service, Kubernetes, CodeStream. All of these are services that are running on that proxy. It's a Docker host. It's a Docker host that runs and, and accesses protected images that we host and facilitates communication between the both. So, from an architecture standpoint, when we look at how that plays in, a, in an enterprise, you're going to want to make sure that where, that where that cloud proxy lives has access to your vCenter. And if it, do, if it only has access to one vCenter, you're going, to want to, you're going to need to deploy multiple of these based on the endpoints they're communicating with. But when we get over to CodeStream, it gets really interesting because CodeStream has a ton of endpoints it supports. On-prem JFrog, on-prem Bitbucket, so on and so forth but I'm not gonna need new proxies for each of these products, which is really nice. No, it's one, one proxy, and there's even, there's, um, without going too far into it, there's efforts, there's a number of our products that have a similar requirement, things like VRNI, things like VMware Cloud and AWS. Wouldn't it be nice if they were all one appliance? Things to think about. So that's how we bring, when we do a vSphere or a VMware Cloud and AWS today, we deploy a proxy out, it establishes a secure communication between the two, and that traffic goes back and forth between that, between that proxy. So that implies you, t you treat VMC on AWS just as another um, vSphere deployment, primarily. In that way. In that way. In that way. Um, there's other things that are different about it, and there's things that are being enhanced around that. Um, specifically, you can use the API key to do authentication against VMware Cloud and AWS, whereas on-prem it's username and password. Um, and there's other things that come along with using that API key, like discovery, because if you ever use VMware Cloud and AWS, that URL is about four feet long. So, so you don't always know that by heart, whereas you probably know, all, everyone here probably knows their vCenters by heart and knows how to connect to them, but I would challenge anyone here to know their VMC URL by heart. Um, there's a couple things that are different, and in the very, like, we're talking like VMworld soon time frame, you'll see a lot more differences between them. But so short answer, today, right now, yes, they are treated very, very similar. To that point, if you went, if you avoided the API key and deployed it and exposed the ports, you could connect username and password to VMC if you wanted to. So now we've got this blueprint, we've got this environment deployed with our, with our new blueprints in place. We've seen the different ways that we can deploy applications into the platform using things like Puppet and Ansible and Cloud Init. But there's a whole other a whole other story, and we see that that's finished up here. So if I go in, we can actually see from a history standpoint that's been completed. And if I go into the properties of this deployment, we can actually see 
the scripting that was run against that, where it went out, cloned from my repo. And again, that's a public repo, so if you ever want to see how that application was written, that's under codeed slash tfd-demo. So it's just a regular Clarity app. For those of you who don't know Clarity, it's a UI toolkit that VMware wrote. So that is this application right here. So we can see how those have been deployed between all three of those methodologies. But there's another type of application delivery that is quickly coming up. You guys might have heard of it, the thing called Kubernetes. It's probably come up quite a bit. We also have the ability to interact with uh, Kubernetes environments. The specific integration uh, from a you know, deep level integration is PKS, so PKS Enterprise. So the ability to tie into an enterprise PKS environment and deploy clusters from enterprise PKS is a capability of the platform. We also have the ability to onboard what we call external clusters. So that's any Kubernetes cluster that's not PKS. And what you get out of that is the ability to manage cube configs. So you get an interface to be able to pull down any cube configs from those environments. You're able to see details about that cluster, what, how many nodes it is, what, how, many, how much memory is available, CPU, basic statistics information. And in the near future, you'll be able to use that against, you, you can use it against CodeStream today, but there'll be a native capability to when you add it in here to have it add into CodeStream as well. I have PKS bound in my environment, but it's about a 40 minute time to deploy, so we're just not gonna do that today. <laughs> but I could come in, I could do add, I could choose my PKS endpoint, it's gonna spin for a few. I can choose uh, what environment I wanna deploy, oh, actually I can onboard that existing one if I wanted to. I can onboard it via IP, or the master host name. I can add it into an environment, so I could do you know, the tech field day environment if I wanted to. I could bring that cluster in. I think it's gonna error out though because, yeah, because it's still running from a previous deployment. Conversely, I can go in and I can deploy a cluster from scratch as well inside of, inside of this platform. So again, we give you the ability to manage not just VMs that deploy, but platforms that you're looking to consume as well. Cody, when you mean that you can import uh, um, standalone uh, Kubernetes cluster, not not PKS. Yeah, like OpenShift or AKS, EKS. Was that was that was it? Did I beat, did I beat you to the question? Yes. Yeah, GKE. Um, GKE, sorry. Yeah, yeah, or um, VMware Cloud PKS, yes. the other one. All of those. You read, you read my mind. <laughs> we have a mind meld going. It's a magical thing. Uh, the key word there is anything with an exposed master. Because there are some Kubernetes clusters that deploy behind, behind security and they, they expect CI, CD to be the only thing that deploys onto them. So as long as you have an exposed master for your either for public cloud or your cloud proxy to talk to, you can bind it. I, I deployed a kubeADM cluster and used Calico as the networking layer and did BGP and all that stuff over the weekend. I was able to add that into CAS. The only difference between the two modes is that uh, the uh, external, external cluster and connect to any any cluster on any platform, the PKS mode, uh, take advantage advantages, sorry, of the PKS integration. Yes, and the, the key, the, the value add, I hate saying that word, um, is that when you bind PKS, you get to create clusters. Yeah. So if I if I have, like I can create a blueprint, for example, if we pop back into blueprints and that was gonna be the next thing, so you, so you guys are good because you're leading me down the paths that this I need to go basically down. Basically drives Bosch to create Exa cluster. Boom, okay. boom. So we can see this PKS Kubernetes cluster, this is a blueprint that will go out and deploy against, against my PKS environment. So I fill in the plan that I want, I select how many master or how many uh, worker nodes I want, and it'll go out over Bosch, deploy, do its magic, everybody's happy, and doing cube cuddles all day. So again, if I, if I had added a cluster, if I deployed it, it would be bound to the project and any members of that project would see that cluster as a resource. So if I've added the four of you to my project and, we, and you guys logged into the platform, you would be able to actually go in and say, oh, C Cody had deployed three Kubernetes clusters to us. We can pull a cube config for any of these and connect into it. Managing cube configs when you have a ton of different Kubernetes environments is a bit of a pain. It's getting easier now that people have created add-ons, but it's nice to have the ability inside of a cloud management platform to, to give that back to you. So talking about advanced applications beyond just creating blueprints, we also have an in-product marketplace that exists, and these are uh, blueprints that we've written and curated into the environment. Uh, so there's Redshift, Puppet, uh, again, Puppet, as we've talked about before, RDS with EC2. Think about these less as applications that you would want to consume. I mean, no one's, no one's beating down the door to deploy a mean stack on Ubuntu 16. Think about these as 
as examples of how to blueprint. It's a different platform and blueprinting is very different in this platform than in, in other environments. These blueprints are here to help you understand how to craft blueprints and how to build a multi-node environment. So when you were talking about this is really cool, I'm learning this, by the time you leave here, you're going to be like, man, I have no idea where to get started on actually building an application. <laughs> but you can come in and you can grab three of these down and say, oh, look, there's a Drupal blueprint in there. Interested in that? And you can see how we did it in there and build your own. That's, that's how people learn how to code is by hijacking Alan Renoff's code on PowerCLI <laughs> or, or, or finding a GitHub repo and, and stealing. And, ste and it's not even stealing. It's stealing in a funny way. But that's how people learn. So we've provided out. Examples, I've been on the team that helps build these and helps deliver these. Like we, we intend, intentionally have these there for people to pull down, look at, and learn how to blueprint off of. Some of them are, a lot of them are useful in specific scenarios, but you're all customers in, in, in various ways. You know that anything you deploy into your enterprise is gonna be super customized anyways. So this blueprint is probably not gonna solve everything you need out of it, but it's sure gonna teach you how to get there. Again, there's a number of these. We can either open it natively, which means it'll pop up as a, as a download that you can open in VS Code and work in, or we can do a git, which will send it right into your project. So if I did, for example, I don't know, multi -tier NSX, I could hit next. I can send it to the tech field day group that I did. I can choose the name. And I can do a git, and it'll pop right into my blueprint screen right away. So now we've got a healthy amount of applications available. I like my Tech Field Day web app. I feel accomplished as a dev. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to release this into the catalog now as something I can consume and make available for standard users to come in and consume. Because not everybody needs to go in and build blueprints, nor do you want everybody going in and building blueprints. You're going to end up with a ton of trouble tickets of people saying, I put a space in the wrong spot and now my stuff won't deploy. Standard users are always going to come in through a regular catalog. So I'm going to come in, I'm going to release a few of these blueprints. Do the Kubernetes one also. And we're going to shift gears into uh, Service Broker now as the area for creating, uh, creating catalog items. Actually, one more thing because I saw it on the screen and I wanted to highlight. We can also uh, create networking components in here. So this isn't anything uh, different, or this is this is not different from creating on-demand networks in VRA, with the exception that these can now be standalone objects. So we can use NSXT with Cloud Automation Services and provision out load balancers, networks, add them to network profiles and consume them within the platform. And we call that provider infrastructure as code. So it's another way for like service providers to be able to say, hey, I need a new network to deploy this infrastructure onto. Cool, here's your catalog item for it. I'll add it to a profile. You can tag it and consume it in the environment. Something interesting to, that reminded me from John's conversation earlier, uh, there was a question about tagging workloads. CAS can natively tag workloads across public cloud and private cloud. So if you want to apply vCenter tags, you can do that in CAS as part of the, as part of the blueprint. If you want to apply tags to your workloads in NSX, NSXT, you can do that. If you want to do it in AWS, you can do it there as well. So we have native tagging across all of those environments. Just remember that I wanted to mention that. So we're going to switch over to Service Broker now. Again, Service Broker is the catalog engine. It's also where policies live. It's where you set things like lease policies. It's where people customize catalog items. So I have a bunch of stuff in here already that have, were published out from previous projects. I'm going to come into content, po content policies. And from a content source, I'm going to do a new content source, and I'm going to choose Cloud Assembly Blueprints. TFD BPs. I'm going to hit that first. Choose my project. I'll hit validate. And it's going to come back that there are two available because that's how many I released. So I'll create an import. And just to clean up the environment a bit, I'm going to actually clear off a few of these so that we're not seeing all of them anymore. 
Content sharing allows me to take blueprints that were built in one project and make them available into other projects. So it's a way of having one project be kind of the single source of truth for blueprinting if you want, or to share something, hey, I really like what the database team did for that SQL server, I wanna use it in my web app server. We can configure that here to share a blueprint across projects. In this case, we're gonna do tech field day. We're gonna just add in both of those blueprints that were done. Awesome. We can see all of the content that's been published here. I could come in here and I could build a custom form around this. So in this one, we can see I have a custom form enabled already. So if I come in and choose customized form, I've cleaned up some of the field names. I've added some conditions between those so that when I choose one option, it populates other fields. Essentially just making a more user-friendly and consumable form. We're not gonna go through and build a whole custom form because it's just not that exciting. Disagree. <laughs> very cool. It's, it's very cool, it's just not exciting to build them. <laughs> uh, from a policy standpoint, we have lease policies in the platform now. There's, this is gonna expand to other types of policies, but lease policies allow you to configure when things automatically expire. No one likes to have a massive EC2 VM up for six months without knowing about it. Configure lease policies early and often. So I'm gonna set this for 10 days on my lease for a total of 100 days, meaning I can have 10 deployments at 10 days or I can have one machine there for 100 days. Actually, I'm sorry, but no, it wouldn't do it that way. It'd only be 10 machines for 10 days. I should call that lease, we'll do create. And then I could come in here, I could see all of the enforcement for these. So it's gonna go through and it's gonna say, hey, all of these things have been enforced by a lease policy already. That's all configured, if I come in here, We'll see, I've cleaned it up so all of those things are now gone. If I had multiple versions released, I could choose the version here. So that becomes very useful when you've made some form of a change, like maybe version three is the, the high availability version. I prefer to do that in inputs and have drop downs, but hey, we can, we can all do what we dream. You'll notice it looks very similar to what you see inside of, inside of uh, the cloud assembly screen. The deployment screen is effectively the same, it's just scoped to what you have access to. So that's deploying again, we have all of these out in the environment. We're gonna clean up a few of these because otherwise I'll forget. Again, go through and these will clean up in the environment. Now we're coming up on towards the, towards the end of the overall, um, the kind of what I would call the traditional infrastructure, traditional private cloud use case stuff. Uh, so I wanna touch on a couple, of, a couple of different things. I talked a little bit about the API before, and that the API is, is available and able to be used. The API is available for nearly everything inside of the platform. This is another huge change because originally in the early VRA days, not everything had an API or a public API around it. There, one of our PMs or one of our PMs on the team, they, he actually did a demo. He wrote a demo script that used the API to provision the entire environment. And you could have a fully functioning CAS environment in sub one minute with this. It goes out and it collects environment and I'll show it to you on the screen right now. Mm -hmm. Little postman action, if I can make this, drag this over, come on, come on, there we go. It's a little small, but this will go through and effectively do all of the things that are needed for an environment to come up, including log, or log into the system, get a bearer token back, create cloud accounts, create cloud zones, create projects, create all of the different mapping concepts. So we didn't talk too much about mapping, but the idea of, consider that in AWS there's about little over 100, I think it's like 120,000 AMIs. We create mappings to make it so that when you say Ubuntu, it knows what AMI or template or Azure image to provision. We create a definition around it. So this goes in and creates all of that content. Uh, it goes in and creates a blueprint, creates the integrations for that, searches out the different images that are available, creates the network profiles, and will actually provision out a workload. And it does all of this, you can accomplish that end to end in less than a minute which demos really well and it looks really cool and you're like, well, that, that's awesome. It doesn't, at first glance, it doesn't seem like it has a lot of practical use, but consider 
how it is when you would bring on a new project. I was on a call with a customer yesterday who they want to be able to do self-service project creation. So when someone's bringing on a new project, they want to have it wrapped in a policy so that they get an approval for it. And if they hit approve, the person plugs in their AWS credentials, their Azure credentials, and it goes out and creates that project end to end. With a fully functional API behind that, we can do that. The hands-on lab is actually powered behind this. Me and a guy named Grant Orchard, we wrote a set of Python bindings for this API. So we, the hands-on lab, if you go to the VMware hands-on labs and you log into the CAS lab, you'll get an org that has AWS and vSphere already configured. When that pod boots up, it uses the SDK we wrote over the API to go out and build out all of that pre-staged stuff so you're not clicking through very boringly <laughs> and building out things that are not as interesting as blueprinting. So our goal, I did a blog post a while back that I caught a little bit of a little bit of flack around because I called it, a, it was an API first blog blog post, and people came back and had comments that not every not all the API is there. We're shooting for API first. We're doing our best. It's it's a it's a journey and it's something we're working towards. If we can get into a place where I can give you an org that's functional and you can use this to provision out an environment in 60 seconds, that's pretty darn close to API first. That's that, that's on the right path at least. So, again, API is fully functional. We have the Swagger Docs out there. There's blog posts out that have all of the Swagger Docs out, so you could easily find those and build your own API calls or visit VMware Flings and look for the Python SDK.